Last time I went to the grocery store, I saw these cereal boxes that have the tag 20% more. And you and I both know that just means 20% more air and 20% more packaging. Fortunately for us, there was this video game not that long ago that dared to do the opposite. An RTS game where they thought, hmm, maybe we could make the maps the size of a small country? And you know what, let's allow them to build 5 times more units. And the game called Supreme Commander was born. Hello there and welcome to RNR, which stands for RTS Retrospective where we replay games of a genre that has gone by and tell ourselves, was this really as magical as I remember? Now Supreme Commander here is a game that is still very much ingrained into my memory, even up to this very day. And if memory serves right, I played this game when I was only 12 years old. And 12 year old me was really dumb. And my brain just could not process all the information that was being fed to me. Especially coming from a background of games such as Red Alert 2 and Warcraft 3, where you keep your eyes on the minimap at all times, all the while building yourself a base and eventually building a death ball. Now this game had no minimap, or rather a minimap that functions the same as your regular map. And did I forget to mention But you can play this app? Because you absolutely can. The base game and this expansion pack released back in 2007 developed by a company known as Gas Powered Games and published by THQ, a company which I fondly remember as the publishers of many video games that I still love, even up to today, games like Age of Mythology, Titan Quest, and Darksiders, among so many others. This game also happens to be the spiritual successor of a 1998 video game called Total Annihilation, which released when my primitive monkey brain was only capable of thoughts like, Mmm, hungry. Mmm, pee pee. Which unfortunately means I have not been able to play that game, nor any of its successors, to be honest, such as Planetary Annihilation. Or maybe I did but I just forgot. But let's hope to remedy that soon, once I get the time. Now this little game here managed to sell around 1 million copies, and around another 1 million more after releasing on Steam, according to this article by Graham Mason of Eurogamer, in which he interviewed Chris Taylor. The game managed to sell 2 million copies overall. Now, 2 million is a pretty good number, but if you're comparing it to games like StarCraft, which sold a grand 11 million copies, then 2 million is barely an itch on somebody else's balls. Having a very big map as compared to other games of its genre like Red Alert and StarCraft was actually to its detriment because it was rather hard to e-sportify. Now, if we once again compare this to the game StarCraft, StarCraft had a much more limited number of units, meaning that counters were easier to plan and build. The smaller map size also meant that it was easier to observe all the things going on around. And you could also easily predict what your enemy's composition was, depending on what tech buildings he has. Like if you see lurkers, then you know what's next. And let's tie in the fact that RTS games were already a relatively niche gaming genre that spawned a much more popular genre called MOBAs, which did nothing for this ailing genre. And then the developers released a sequel and copied StarCraft. And I hated it. But let's go ahead and replay this gem of a game, starting with the intro cinematic.
closing in on this location. Get that ship out of here. Engines coming online. Just need a couple more minutes. Primary thrusters engaged. Launch trajectory plotted. Bandits on screen. ETA to intercept, four minutes. That's your window. Roger. Now it's time for some paint lore. So, very far into the future, humans have invented something called quantum traveling. Now, using this quantum magic thingamajig, humanity managed to colonize nearby planets, forming the fledgling Earth Empire. And eventually, this fledgling Earth based empire shattered into three the UEF, the Aeon, and the Cybrans. The Aeon here are humans who met an alien race called the Seraphim, who taught these humans a philosophy called The Way, which was allegedly all about peace and love, which of course caused the old Earth Empire to start killing them off until they're all gone. Now the humans who were following this way eventually renamed themselves the Aeon, or the Aeon Illuminate. And then we have the Cybrans, which are your half-human, half-cyborg, uh, humans. And that's, that's pretty much it. The Cybrans are just here as, you know, so we can have cyborg humans in this game. And they're pretty much always in the B-plot. And lastly, we have the UEF, or the United Earth Federation, which is basically whatever remains of the old Earth Empire that didn't go into Aeon or Cybran. No, they are very ultra-nationalistic, very military-oriented, and are quite xenophobic. The Aeon have been consistently pushing back the UEF, and the UEF has been consistently killing off the Sirens. But our UEF buddies here have a secret weapon called the Black Sun, which will allow them to destroy a planet. Of course, being the good guys here, the UEF won. But the usage of the Black Sun caused a quantum rift allowing the Seraphim back into their world, leading to our intro cinematic. And after booting up the game, I set it to 1920 by 180 p and everything appears to be nice and well in place. And one important thing is we have a tutorial. So every game, both in the campaign and in the skirmish modes, start with something called your ACU or your Armored Command Unit, which will be responsible for building everything you need at the start of the game. And here we have our ACU. Look at it. It's pretty nice. The tutorial is locked to UEF, so this is a UEF ACU. The controls are pretty standard. Left click to select, right click to enact. Now this is a thing I find particularly jarring about the movement in this game. 
while the movement is pretty okay, all of your units have to turn and they turn very very slowly. Not really something I expected, you know, when the game is set in the far far future. Also, the base pan speed and zoom sensitivity is a bit too fast for me. I have to turn it down. Our ACU buddy here can also attack land units, and it has a very respectable ground attack, which also varies depending on faction, with Cybern having the highest DPS ACU, the UEF having the most durable, while the Aeon and the Seraphim have very powerful shields, but are still not close in durability to the UEF ACU. But they do have certain special abilities like the Aeon ACU having higher resource production. Pretty interesting that the game decides to start us with combat rather than building. So here is a building tutorial. So everything in this game is built with two resources called mass and energy, with the green being mass and yellow being energy. Now mass here needs to be placed on specific deposits called mass deposits, which you can see here on the screen as green icons. However, later in the game, you can also convert energy into mass using something called a mass fabricator. However, those are very energy intensive and pretty late in the game. So most of your mass early on will come from mass extractors. Now mass here is used to build everything and will basically be the resource that will cap your production. Every time you build a building or produce a unit from a factory, Let's it will consume a certain amount of mass command. depending on the production speed. And for every point of mass use, well it was done. going to use a and certain amount of mass. energy as well. And the other slightly less valuable resource energy is called is energy. Now energy here is collected using power, power generator and can be built anywhere. So theoretically, the only limit to your energy production is either your unit cap or your space available. Now as said earlier, power here is consumed whenever you build units or buildings. It's also used to power certain other things such as your shields, your radar, and is consumed every time an artillery fires a salvo. Now since you can just build more, technically that is also limited by mass. Now the power generators here are also explosive and they will often cause a chain reaction when destroyed, leading to catastrophic power failures. However, a mechanic not discussed in the tutorial is actually very contradictory to this, and we'll talk about it later. Most of our production is handled via factories, of which there are three. You have a land factory, which will produce land units, an air factory, which produces air units, and of course, a naval factory that produces naval units. Now, there are units that are classified as amphibious, which means they can be produced by both land and naval factories. And with our first land factory, we need to start producing our first engineers. Now, tier 1 engineers, or the first engineers that you can produce from a factory, are actually very important early on in the game, because your ACU is enabled to build certain structures until it is upgraded further. The most important of these buildings is called your radar, and the other also important building is called your mass and energy storage, which are pretty self-explanatory. Now, radars here are very important because they give you something called radar, and sonar for the underwater version. Now what this does is it allows you to see enemy movement and enemy attack waves in the campaign, so you don't get unexpectedly blasted from behind. The disadvantage of radar is that it does not give you specific information about units, such as their type, their tier, their HP. It is in contrast to direct vision, which all units have, and give you very accurate information. However, it changes significantly lower than for radar, for obvious reasons. And another good feature of this game is when you zoom out, unit graphics are actually replaced by icons, which also actually provide more information than seeing the graphics of the units, because you know what type of unit that is, and if it's ground, air, or underwater. And this zoomed out feature also functions with artillery projectiles, which you can see here as the yellow dots. And on slower speeds, this is actually useful because you can kind of dodge projectiles. And they also serve as an indicator of where your enemy is bombarding you from if you don't have radar. And the last most important information from this tutorial is... When an ACU dies, it will release a nuclear-sized explosion. And is also considered the win condition for most games. So avoid using your ACU in the front lines, unless you want to lose very quickly. And that is our tutorial. And now let's get into our campaign, which has us evacuating civilians in a place called Fort Clark. Now we are going to be playing as the Aeon for this playthrough, because the Aeon get access to this really really powerful building called the Paragon, and it gives you infinite resources, so that you can fill and flood the map with your white Aeon units. And meanwhile, the commanders of the UEF and Cybern will be left out there pumping dust. Now let's go and save Fort Clark. And you do get three difficulty options, easy, medium, or normal, and hard. And I do remember hard being quite difficult, especially if you know nothing about this game. And we will go with hard. And here we are, thick into battle. 
with the quantum gate we're supposed to teleport to being destroyed by gunships. There's also functions as the race selection screen. And of course we're gonna go with Aeon. And as our magnificent ACU steps out, all those gunships blasting our gate suddenly kneel to the ground. And we start repairing our base. Now the tutorial missed a lot of important things, such as here. You can actually reclaim units and buildings, which gives you the mass used to build that building or unit. Which then encourages a behavior that is not really workable in multiplayer games, but is the way to go in the campaign. And that strategy is called turtling, in which you rush your factory to tier 3 so you can get, build tier 3 engineers, all while building all defense buildings in your base in order to ward off enemy attacks. You then build up your economy using your tier 3 engineers, and then you build your death ball, which are usually experimentals, which we will see later. Now the tech 3 in this game is rather simple, in that there is 3 tiers, you have tier 1, tier 2, and tier 3. The only thing that will determine what you can build is the level of your factories. And each factory is leveled up separately from each other. Which means as you can see I am rushing myself to tier 3. Now a tier 3 factory can produce tier 1, tier 2, and tier 3 units. As well as building those units much faster. Meaning that leveling up your factories is very important. And of course as units go up in tier they also get a lot stronger. And I notice they haven't really shown you the map so here is our initial map. So you can see we are stuck here on the southwestern side and our enemy is to the northeast. Now they are very heavily fortified and so we have to tier up to tech 3 and depend on air units or transports which I do not like. And so we use air units. And then I also realized why did I build a land factory when I'm going to use air units? But hey at least we got it to tier 3 and we are now producing tier 3 engineers meaning that we can start ramping up our economy and also our base defenses. And the really good thing about this game is that all the maps you are thrown thick into the action, so there is no boring parts to the game. And here's something that is also not explained in the tutorial but is a very important feature, is that as both buildings and units kill enemy units, they start to gain veterancy levels similar to Red Alert, which increases their stats and more importantly for buildings, gives them a base regeneration, meaning that you do not have to manually repair your base. Also, leveling up in veterancy gives you a burst of HP, such that if your tier 3 unit is being sworn by tier 1s and 2s, if it gets a veterancy level, then you're safe. And while we're waiting for our engineers to finish building, can we just admire this shield graphic? Still looks pretty good. And the shield generator is not looking very good though, but I can't really afford to repair it just yet. And as you've noticed in this campaign, enemy units come in waves, similar to Starcraft, and they increase in difficulty as well. And paired together with veterancy, encourages turtling in the campaign even more. And as more and more of our tier 3 engineers come online, it's time to decommission our old engineers via reclamation. Here's another thing the tutorial missed, is that your ACU is a modular upgradable unit, where you can upgrade things like personal shields, teleporters, buffing up your main gun and increasing your resource production. Now these upgrades cost a lot of mass and energy so it's not really practical to use early on. Unless of course you manage to store a lot of mass and have a lot of power plants for the energy consumption. Oof and our base is taking a beating. Our shield generator is down which means we need to start amping up our defenses. It's not looking too good for me. Will I survive? But you know every moment spent thinking is time spent not building. Let's build. So let's build a line of anti-air turrets here so that I can continue explaining this ACU upgrade system. So the ACU has three slots, left, middle, and right, and they all have specific upgrades for them, as you can see here. But we won't bother with this set for the moment. It is however important to note that this upgrade, tier 2 and tier 3, are almost always chosen, meaning that other upgrade almost never sees the light of day. And that's because the ACU here is a construction powerhouse and is significantly better at building than tier 3 engineers because it is after all limited at 1 and if it's destroyed, well, you're gone. And 3 hours of your life is magically gone. And as our eastern defense line gets damaged, I think this is also a good time to explain another feature not explained by the tutorial. So when you build over a destroyed building, it will start out at half of the production time. 
and mass requirement, which will speed up your rebuilding. And another very important thing the tutorial never mentioned is something called adjacency bonuses. When you build buildings adjacent to each other and they are in a cardinal direction, they gain certain bonuses. This mass extractor here, when connected to a mass storage, actually produces more mass for the same energy consumption. And the same goes with power plants and energy storages. Now if you build a power plant next to a mass extractor, that mass extractor will then use less energy to produce the same amount of mass. And that's pretty much adjacency bonuses. So you can connect your shield generator to a power plant to reduce its energy consumption, which will save you mass in the long term because you need less power plants. And I think that covers everything that the tutorial missed, so let's speed up this game. Because a typical campaign map takes around 3-4 to four hours to finish. So let's speed it up. Oh, and when I thought I had covered everything, there is one other thing I forgot. So buildings can be upgraded, but certain buildings such as, such as certain shield generators and base defenses cannot be upgraded. Which means if you build a building at tier 1, you can eventually upgrade it into tier 2 and eventually tier 3. So you don't have to replace any of your tier 1 buildings with tier 3 buildings manually. And now let's actually play this map. Now every so often the game is going to nag you like this. We're going to lose Fort Clark unless you get on with it. Destroy those bases. And this will happen very very frequently. However, there is absolutely zero benefit to rushing your objective. Because every time you complete an objective, the map expands and you will be swarmed. So we turtle. Okay, nice. We've set up our base. We've set up an economy. Spammed a lot of anti-air defenses. And we've built ourselves here some support command units. Which are basically just ACUs in that they can be upgraded. But if they get destroyed, you won't lose the game. They will explode though. So if you have a lot of them clumped together, together with your main ACU, you are still going to die. Let's put out the finishing touches on our economic buildings, including storage, so that eventually we can start producing ourselves some of those delicious and deadly experimental units. But first, let's demonstrate how weak tier 3 air units are, even against your first objective in this map. So over at the upper part of my base, I have built myself a number of gunships, which are tier 3 units that are capable of attacking both land and air, but are not very good at either. So here, let's send them out at normal speed over to the artillery positions to see just how much damage they can do. And this is as much as I expected, so not too bad, not too good either. Which means I will now produce our first experimental unit called the Tempest. Now, experimental units here are massive units that take a lot of mass but are insanely powerful. The Tempest here is a massive naval battleship that is capable of attacking both ground, air, and submarines. Uh, and look at all the mass I've accumulated on the eastern part of my base. Too bad I'm too lazy to reclaim them all. And I do have unlimited time. I reinforce the eastern part of my base and then you can hear in the background our Tempest is already firing and probably obliterating a lot of enemy units. So let's see it in action. So it's firing its main gun and is killing what I assume are naval battleships of the enemy. However, the anti-air of this experimental is not impressive at all so we have to keep it near our base or it will be annihilated by those gunships. I eventually transitioned to Zars, which are honestly one of the most impressive experimentals in this game. Like did you see that laser? So I start mass producing them and then I will charge all of them in the enemy base. So here are those Zars charging in the enemy base at normal speed and look at them annihilate everything on the ground and air. Doesn't it look glorious? Too bad you can't really see them destroying stuff too much because the giant disc is blocking your view. But it still looks impressive nonetheless. And another thing about the Zar is that when it gets destroyed, it will crash into the ground and destroy everything underneath it. So let's send one of our Zars here into that enemy fortification. And as it gets shot down by enemy anti-air, we and bam. Scorched Earth, baby. Using our massive amount of Zars, 
I rush the enemy commander and destroys the ACU. Alright, first mission done. The civilians of Fort Clark are safe. Thank you, overpowered czars. Couldn't have done it without you. And of course, my game crashes. Now, these crashes are very frequent occurrences, occurring almost after every mission. I restart my game and start playing as the UEF this time. Now, the second mission here is all about saving some loyalists who also function as our intelligence agents. And we don't want them spilling our secrets, so we are supposed to rescue them. Now, this second mission is actually pretty good and also pretty hard. So we start off here trying to kill a bunch of units that are assaulting our ally. And I remember there were times where I failed this mission from the start. Now the difficulty curve in this game is quite random I feel. Because the next mission after this is very easy. And then the two missions after that are insanely hard. And then you have the last mission which is just a cakewalk. And I feel like it's this way because this is the expansion pack. And so they don't want you starting off very slow with just a few units and they give you everything at at the start of the campaign, and I feel like the missions were an afterthought. There's also very little variation in the missions in this game. It's all standard build destroy. You don't get maps where you get limited amounts of units without buildings, and you have to destroy certain enemy buildings in order to progress to the building part of the game. This is as close as we can get, because you spend the first 5 minutes of the game defending your ally. And while you can build, if you don't defend your ally, they will die. And eventually we managed to clear out the enemy assault forces. But there is one main gripe I have with this mission in particular. So you see your ally there on the lower left? They are practically useless. After the first 10 minutes, you're actually busy defending them. And they actually become more of a liability than an asset. And they actually become more of a liability than an asset. Now fortunately you don't have to defend them, but it always feels good when you don't let them die. Alright, so now we're back to the usual. Build a base tech up to tier 3, and spam experimentals. And unfortunately after a bit of tug of war with the enemy forces, I lose up most of my base and my ally is crippled. And I guess this means only one thing, I have to restart. So I restart my game, because it always crashes, and do this mission all over again. And while this playthrough went better than the first one, our ally over there is once again crippled. To the point that they have almost no unit production capabilities. And so I take over the resources and eventually get myself a base. Then we start our production of our first experimental. So the UEF experimental here is called the Fat Boy. And this unit is a factory itself, which means it can produce units. However, we're not going to use it to produce units, we're going to use it to destroy the enemy. Now the Fat Boy here has a very good anti-ground armaments, but is also very weak to air and even weaker against submarines. We eventually managed to expand our base and we can now start mass producing our fat boys, which we use to charge our enemy. However, they are stopped by a mountain. Thanks, game. I then produced myself something called a Mavor, which is an experimental artillery that is considered a game ender because it has unlimited range and so it can snipe an enemy ACU from the other side of the map. And with the power of this artillery installation and our fat boys, we complete our objective. The next part of the mission has us going through a snake pass filled with slopes and mountains, which is not a problem because we've accumulated a lot of experimental fat boys. Plus we can soften up the target with our experimental artillery. Now I was going to charge my fat boys into that pass but it looks like our Mavor experimental artillery already destroyed pretty much 90% of the enemy base. Minus the air units it can't hit. But I still need to send our experimental fat boys there to clean up the area so that we can send an engineer to capture the enemy objective, which holds the prisoners. And eventually, we do that, rescue our Black Widows, and expanding to the next and last part of the map. And I think I forgot to mention this in the paint lore section, but the Aeon Illuminate is split into two factions. You have the pro-aliens and the anti-aliens. And Princess Rianne Burke here is the supposed leader of the anti-alien faction. However, she went into hiding to protect herself, which caused a lot of the former loyalists to defect to the pro-alien faction. And now she suddenly started to reveal herself, which means that the defectors who joined the pro-alien part once again defect back to the anti-alien part, causing a schism. You know, pretty typical stuff for religions. Schisms and such. Now the enemy commander here named Gari, upon hearing Princess Rianne's voice, suddenly had a change of heart and starts nuking the Seraphim. 
And the last part of this mission is that we have to destroy the enemy Seraphim commander, which I intended to do. Unfortunately, I believe our Mavor artillery accidentally killed the enemy Seraphim commander. Now the map expanded first, however the objectives didn't update until the game's dialogue was finished and boy do these guys like to monologue. And so while they were busy monologuing and I was running at 10 times speed, my artillery destroyed the ACU of the enemy commander and so the game bugged. And again I was forced to restart this game and restart this mission. So let's mark this as done and proceed to mission 3. Now mission 3 occurs on this ice planet with an island map wherein we have to rescue Princess Rianne Burke as she is being attacked by the pro-alien Aeon faction after revealing herself in the last mission. So of course it's up to us, the good guys, to rescue her. Now this mission is a lot easier than the previous mission. However, the map is an island map. So once again, no land units and no land experimentals. And the key to this mission is just to build a lot of anti-air. And for the UEF, you need your Mavor artillery and fat boys for offense. And for some reason, our ally once again crippled. This time by losing their ACU. Which is weird because her base is still fully up and operational. It's not so bad, she's kind of useless. As per usual, we build our fat boys and charge them all the way up north and destroy the enemy base. Which then leads to the second part of this mission where we have to destroy enemy bombers. Now these bombers were the exact same bombers you saw in the intro cinematic. So we charge our fat boys to the enemy bombers. And while the characters are busy yapping around, I eventually managed to finish the objective. And fortunately, it doesn't bug out this time. Which means we proceed to the next part of this mission, which is to kill the enemy Seraphim commander assaulting Princess Burke's base. And so we park our fat boys outside Burke's base, wait for the Mavor to do its work, and eventually this mission is also done. Now mission 4 is as B-plot as it gets. We are going to assist the Cybrans here, who are being led by Doscha on this barren volcanic planet. And I don't really know why we're here in the first place, because really you can remove this mission from the game and nothing will change, except Doscha will be alive. So instead of showing the mission objectives, I'm going to let Doscha tell you the story. Complete your objective as quickly as possible, Commander. Doscha out. Complete your objective as quickly as possible, Commander. Doscha out. Finish your objective as quickly as possible, Commander. Doscha out. Complete your objective as quickly as possible, Commander. Dostja out. Finish your objective as quickly as possible, Commander. Dostja out. Complete your objective as quickly as possible, Commander. Dostja out. Finish your objective as quickly as possible, Commander. Dostja out. HQ, I have completed my objective and am reinforcing my position. Dostja out. Complete your objective as quickly as possible, Commander. Dostja out. I have a situation here. The recall command is auto failing. HQ, can you confirm? Please run diagnostics on the return gate. HQ, please respond. Commander, we have lost all communication with Coalition Command and we cannot recall. Wait, I am registering something to your west. It appears to be a jamming array. It must be what is blocking our communications. Destroy the jamming device. Dostja out. Commander, additional jamming devices are disrupting the quantum field and preventing us from recalling or receiving help. Stay on target and destroy that array blocking our communication. Once it's down, HQ will be able to advise on how to negate the quantum distortions. Dostja out. A Seraphim scout just flew over my base, so they know my position. It won't be long before they attack. The device is destroyed. Dostja to HQ. Respond. There are at least two quantum wakes. You must... Listen to me. The Seraphim have a jamming device that is preventing recall. It's out of our operational area, so you must find a countermeasure. Keep your pants on. We'll get you out of there as soon as we can. Inform General Hall that we've been compromised. That jammer was based on a top-secret prototype created by Dr. Brackman. Oh no! 
Hundreds of enemy units are descending upon my location. Get us out of here, HQ. Operation area expanding. Elite Commander, what's your status? They are all over me. My defenses are failing. I have visual on an ACU, but it's not Serapin. It's Cybran. You are foolish to oppose the Master Dostia. And now, you will pay for your insolence. Hex 5. I should have known that if anyone turned on our beloved father, that it would be you. And now you shall pay for your insults. Goodbye, Dostia. Ah! Getting hit from all sides! Too many of them! Ah! Too many! Elite Commander, come in, do you read me? Commander, you still have enemy forces moving toward your position. Hold the line until we can extract you. HQ out. Do whatever it takes to survive, Commander. We can't afford to lose you too. Haul out. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Cybran story. Goodbye, Dostra. Now, the next part is a continuation of the Cybran story as well. We are there to destroy something called QAI which used to be the AI of the Cyber Nation before the Seraphim came and it turned it back on the Cybrans and joined Seraphim. As this is happening, one of the commanders that we had in the UEF starts to show very increasing signs of paranoia, xenophobia, and insanity. And we're going to tell the story of this mission on his perspective. This whole damn thing is a mess. Cybrans turning on each other? Aeon switching sides just because some princess shows up? I tell you, we can't trust any of them. The blue of the UEF, that's what matters. That's the only thing that matters. Fletcher out. Clear the area, Commander. Fletcher is suited up and ready to gate. HQ out. Destroy Hex 5 small bases. HQ out. If your beloved Dr. Brackman could not control me, what chance do you have? You will bow before the Seraphim. You are incapable of comprehending our might. The Master is endless, his wisdom infinite. You will never defeat us. The Master will punish you for that. Hex-5 secondary bases are destroyed. HQ out. Another commander will not make a difference. You will never defeat me. I'm on ground and on target, Colonel. Let's unplug that damn computer and head home. Fletcher out. Hex 5 is south of Fletcher's position. He must be eliminated. Oh, yes. Assist Fletcher as you are able, Commander. HQ out. Dr. Brackman's loyalty program enslaved billions. That is his shame. I'm at Tech 3, starting to produce units. Starting up my economy, Commander. Fletcher out. Colonel, keep your eyes on Fletcher. He's been showing some irregular behavior as of late. We're so damn close to ending this thing, and we can't afford someone running around half-cocked. Haul out. Starting work on a fat boy. Maintain air cover for me. Fletcher out. Commander, send up a spy plane or two and track down Hex 5. He's cloaked and stealthed, and the only way we're going to find him is through line of sight. Fletcher out. Commander, if I'm going to get anywhere, you're going to have to provide me with air cover. You have to defend my position against air attacks. We've Fletcher got him out. on the ropes. Keep pushing. His base is buckling. He's got almost nothing left. Take him out. Uh, wait! Master! And so a traitor died. Oh, yes. So much loss. So much sorrow. Dr. Brackman, it will be a true pleasure killing you. I am in position, my child. I shall take it from here. 
It's just a simple matter of interfacing. You're an old fool. It was the Seraphim that made me what I am, not you. A father always knows the child's weakness. Oh, yes. There is always a weakness. Your efforts will be for... What are you doing? That is not possible. Goodbye. All right, back to yapping. So this last mission has us assaulting the Quantum Gateway, which they are constructing over the original area where the Black Sun was fired, which will end the threat of the Seraphim, supposedly. This mission is pretty standard, you know, Defend, build an economy, tech up, and then spam your experimentals. And during this entire process, our good old Commander Fletcher goes crazy. Fortunately, I've started using another experimental we unlocked, which places an immortal laser on top that has unlimited range and can snipe ACUs as well. Now, compared to the Malvor, this one is a lot less AoE, but it is a lot more specific and precise. So if you can mass it, then you can annihilate enemy ACUs and cheese the game. Pretty much. And here they are in action, so we send them directly to Fletcher. Now, Fletcher's base has a lot of shields, so we have to pick away at those shields first before we can damage his ACU. However, once the shields are down, his ACU is easy picking. Good night, Fletcher. And then we take our satellites to the enemy commander to the west. Unfortunately for her, she had a Paragon, which causes a nuclear explosion when destroyed, which then chained to her ACU. And now we go to the last part of the game, which is to destroy the Ark. Now unfortunately my game bugged out again, so as you can see, my camera is tilted, because technically the game still considers me inside of a cutscene, but I still have control of my unit and I can send them to do stuff. And we can see how effective these lasers are and mass, they are completely annihilating every single attack wave that's being sent towards our base, and it's really fun to watch. And now that we've had our fun, it's time to end this game. I sick our satellite dogs over to the Seraphim Arcway. And of course, since her game is a bug, nothing happens. So I'm also going to consider this a win. And through some magic, we watch ourselves the ending cutscene. Establishing primary CPU algorithms. Primary CPU algorithms operational. All systems online. Diagnostics complete. Primary directive recognized. Executing. And for anyone wondering what happened, so basically, magical space lady enters into the quantum rift and closes it using magic. Quantum magic, so it's space. Which is then followed by a post credit scene featuring QAI coming back online. However, this plotline was completely abandoned and was completely ignored in the expansion, or the second game. And with all that, how does this game fare against our expectations? First, let's talk about what's good in this game. 
And let's start with the gameplay. The gameplay itself is fun. There's always something to do and the action feels very visceral. More so if you play at 10 times speed because at that point the flaws of the pathfinding become relatively unnoticeable. Controls are also easy and intuitive. Easy because they are typical of your RTS games where you have a left click to select, a right click to do. There are also not that many keybinds, meaning that you can focus all of your brain power onto playing the game. The graphics are also pretty good for a game that released back in 2007. And while the graphics are by no means Bioshock, which also released in 2007, this still holds up pretty good, given that the map is 81 by 81 kilometers. And then experimentals feel powerful. You can feel the difference between an experimental and a tier 3 unit. And as such, it always feels good using them. Nothing beats a czar destroying a base and then crashing into that base's power plants, leading to some volatile chain reactions. And experimentals can make or break your game. And last but not the least is the scale. Having a map size this big is very, very niche and in its own way, good. Having a map this size actually makes the game feel a lot more relaxed, assuming you play at default speed. Because at fast speed, it feels just like StarCraft 2, if not more, actually. Now, the soundtrack itself is decent enough, but this is no Red March. And whenever you play StarCraft and you hear that very insidious Zergo SD, and all of a sudden you're in the mood to devour some Terrans and kill some Protoss, now that's a good soundtrack. And then we have the UI, which is itself not too bad actually, but it is missing some very important information. For example, you can see the health of the units in the UI, but you can't see the damage a unit does or the attack speed. And again, if you compare it to the game StarCraft, you know just how much damage a Hydralisk will do and how many shots it will take before it kills a single Marine. In Supreme Commander, you don't know how much a gunship can do or how many 10 gunships can do. And so you just send your units, which also means you can't tell the difference between a tier 1 gunship and a tier 2 gunship, besides what the description tells you. Lastly, we have the bad. Now, a personal nitpick of mine is how the game nags and prods you in the campaign. So in the campaign, you can't really do anything to speed yourself up, and honestly hearing Dostra tell you to finish your objective 11 times, it gets pretty tiresome. There is also actually no benefit to finishing your map earlier, and finishing an objective unprepared could actually lead you to losing the campaign, because as soon as the map expands when you complete an objective, you get flooded with a swarm of enemy units. And then there's also the fact that the campaign encourages the strategy called turtling, now, turtling as a strategy is okay in the campaign. However, it is one of the worst things you could do in a skirmish game. And I remember before, when my brother and I used to play in the skirmish map, he would be the aggressor and I would always turtle. And he would always win. And maybe it's just because he's a better player than me at RTSs? But at least I'm not the middle child and I was not ignored. Sorry, brother. And the last thing that's bad about this game is the scale, because having a game this size has good and bad parts. Now the big thing about the scale of this game is that it encourages turtling too, especially for newer players and noobs like me. And it also has repercussions for the longevity of the game, because having a map this size meant that the esport community didn't really pop off in the same way StarCraft did. And that esport community is what kept the StarCraft game very vibrant. To the point that people still play StarCraft Brood War and StarCraft 2. However, this game still has a community of players who play skirmish games with each other. And they call themselves the Forge Alliance Forever or FAF. And for how much nostalgia that gave me, I am going to rate it 11 dosches. And if you like this video, don't forget to subscribe and give me a like if you wish. The next game I'm going to do is Spellforce 1, which is a very long game. And with that, it's time for me to say... Test your out.